and welcome back Veta Runners to another exciting podcast. On this week's podcast, Britain's best kept secret and one of the biggest names in ultra running, Tom Evans. Tom Evans is a former Welsh Guards captain, now runs professional for a living. Under his belt, he's got a third place finish in Marathon uh, de Sabs, which he done as a bet. That then obviously kick-started his career. He also have, has a third place finish in Western States, finishing in under 15 hours. Tom has also won the infamous CCC in France. Also won a South Downs way. Tom is not only an extremely good ultra runner, Tom has run a 13 minute 40 something 5k and has also run for Great Britain in um, the World Half Marathon Championships running 63 minutes. Tom then went on to try and qualify for the Tokyo Olympics uh, before pulling out uh, with uh, an injury. Tom joins me today and we talk through mindset, his training, his plans, his transition from uh, the military into professional athlete. Um, we also answer some questions from you guys. So if you do like this video, uh, this podcast, then please do give it a thumbs up. If you're watching on YouTube, make sure to subscribe to the channel. Right, yeah. veter veterans, welcome back. Um, Today on the podcast, we've got not only a former soldier, but turned professional athlete, Tom Evans. Tom, welcome to the podcast. Hello, hello. How are you? Nice to, nice to finally see you. Yeah, good. Um, to be honest, I've been trying to reach out, or I was planning to reach out for you for a while. Um, obviously, the link is there with Vet I run on you being ex-Welsh Guards. Um, so I think it's a, a perfect step to start or kickstart the, the podcast series with, with yourself, really. So um, first, before we start, obviously, we know um, that there's a few races that you could have been in lately um, that you haven't been, um, and that's because of injury. Do you want to discuss what's going on with the injury at the moment? Yeah, so, yeah, it's, it's been such a frustrating one. I, I know everyone... Everyone will have their own examples of this. And I think for me, as a professional athlete, being able to share my injury and how I'm getting better from it, I think is really important. So I guess I've rewinded it a little bit. In February, I've always, my knees have never been great. They were never great when I was serving. I found of just taking a knee incredibly uncomfortable a lot of the time. So I ended up just in sort of anti-aircraft position with my burger <laughs> right, as much as I could. So and using my knees as an excuse. And yeah, every time after every long race I've done, my knees have always been a little bit sore for a little bit of time after. So if I ever get any niggles, it's normally around my knee and my calf. And Things sort of just through lockdown sort of started getting a little bit more difficult and not getting as much physio as I would normally get. And what ended up happening is my IT band just got super tight, um, which was then pulling in my knee. Um, I then developed a stress response in my sort of fibular head, which is due to tight IT bands. And that stress response would have turned into a a stress fracture and then a fracture had the IT band not been loosened off. So after lots of MRI scans and seeing two different specialists, both who said, look, we don't want to do surgery, but it kind of is now your only option. I have done countless rehabilitation processes. I have had, I've done PRP therapy, which is lots of injections into my knee. I've had cortisone steroid shots into my knee. I kind of felt like I had left. I had done everything within my control to do. I'd stopped running. I'd stopped cycling. And by the end of it, I couldn't walk pain-free. And yeah. life is more than life is more than just running. And I just, I can't afford to, to not be pain-free yeah. in day-to-day -day life. And yeah, you take with the good, the good with the bad. And yes, there will be times when things are a bit sore, which is fine. But it got to the point that I couldn't take the dogs out for a walk and I couldn't walk up the stairs properly and down the stairs. So 
yeah, it was a, uh, so I'm now three weeks today post-op. Um, and yeah, it's, the scar is, is pretty Nasty. big. It's not, yeah. It's not, it's not keyhole surgery. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's pretty nasty, but I'm fully weight bearing. I'm off crutches. Um, I should be on the bike next week. So yeah, it's it's okay. Um, I got I got given a a Lego uh, Land Rover Defender to build. Yeah. Um, there's got thousands and thousands of pieces. It's got 498 pages of the instruction manual. I'd be game um, over. I'm terrible at it. I'm I'm 100 pages in after a day, so by the end of next week is the plan to the plan to do it because I can't I can't drive at the moment, which is the biggest the biggest frustration. Um, I've just bought I've just bought myself an old, not quite military, but an old Land Rover Defender, which I've as a project, on, as a project, but it still works, it still drives. Yeah, um, but I can't drive at the moment, so you'll have yeah, to make do. Cool. You'll have to make do with a scooter. Yeah, exactly. Electric scooter, quicker than crutches. Um, they have. I've seen it. With an aero bike helmet, because every, <laughs> every little helps. Yeah. It's class, though. It's just got me out of the house. Yeah. Like, I've... I was just so frustrated that I couldn't do anything. I couldn't leave the house. If I was on my... I, I can't drive anywhere. We're not where we live. Yeah, it's not in the middle of nowhere, but yeah, it, it's a mile to wherever you want to go. At least, so I'm not doing that on crutches. No, um, that'll be hard work. So go on, go on an electric scooter, and yeah. So what's the, what's the time frame? So I had a ACL reconstruction in. Yeah. I snapped my knee in Estonia um, on Opkrabit. Um, I had ACL reconstruction. Uh, end of end of March 2018. Yeah. And. The frustrating part for me was not being able to run, but I knew it was a, it was a process whereby I had to follow the, the rehab. And the rehab, obviously, in the military, you know yourself, is, is truly amazing. But what what's your timeline from having the operation to hoping to take that anti-gravity treadmill first one run-walk uh, program? What's the time scale in months? <sighs> I think in months three. Yeah. Um, I, I'm very good. As, as I was in the military, I will leave no stone unturned. Yeah. And I will do absolutely everything in my power to be as good as I possibly can be. And I love following process. Yeah. And at the moment, I'm doing so much extra stuff so whether it's like my nutrition for example has completely changed in the last three weeks yeah because i don't need extra extra need, calories yeah yeah i don't need extra calories i don't need carbohydrate really yeah because i'm not using that much energy so my overall intake the vo- total volume of food is probably the same because i still have a big appetite yeah but it's just all basically protein and fiber because I want to rebuild muscle and I want to have that sort of protein synthesis and the fiber because it's just water retention. So you don't put weight on to then having a sort of low light, low level light laser therapy. Yeah. I've got a device here and the supplements that I'm now taking and the infrared trousers that i'm wearing to get everything warm so things don't seize up like i'd like to think i can do it pretty quickly i am racing in march is yeah that which, is what i've been which uh, race is that uh trans grand canaria so 128k seven thousand meters of climbing um on the 4th of march yeah um, and then i will race utmb next year and i have no i have no doubt that that will happen yeah um, like i i truly believe yeah i honestly believe that this injury isn't a defining moment no. at all like it's geez if you're not if you don't get injured i don't say you should aspire to get injured because it means you're pushing the boundaries but i was very much flirting with my boundary and i went over it um, yeah and 
as long as you can learn from the mistakes yeah then yeah that's fine and I think for me it's uh yeah as long as I can come out of this not necessarily stronger because yes do I think I will be stronger after, after this yes do I think I will I lose fitness now yes can I get it back yes yeah. um like it's just a it's just a it's just a process and it might be a long process and that process great writing it out on a bit of paper for months in advance but as with the army i didn't know what was happening tomorrow <laughs> um and it's the same with the rehab i might wake up in my knee if it feels great tomorrow then i might push the boat a bit yeah. in the gym but if it doesn't then i'll back off a little bit and i yeah. think having that sort of that flexibility and that adaptive um mind state i think is uh yeah. is really important yeah, sticking on the nutrition. So I'll hit one of the questions is, do you follow a specific diet like vegan or carnivore or anything like that? Not really. Um, I eat really well. Um, I eat a lot of fruits and vegetables. Like my, my diet is the foundation of my diet yeah. is fruit and veg. Yeah. So I am, I am, I am plant based but I eat meat yeah, yeah. Um, and not much. I definitely don't eat as much as I used to. And that for me is an a bit of an environmental reason, but at the same time, I want to be as good at my sport as I possibly can be. And yes, some people have done amazing things being vegan and being the keto and all yeah. of these other diets, but actually sometimes it's not that easy. Like I've raced in Hong Kong where there is no such thing as keto there's no yeah. such thing as being vegan yeah it doesn't work and actually yes you can bring your own food but actually if you're if you're in a a foreign country for two months you've actually just kind of got to buy into yeah buy into what they eat and you don't have that full control so actually just being able to be really flexible and really adaptable i think is really important i've worked with a couple of great nutritionists who help me plan and something that I sort of did in lockdown is I got I say good uh, much better at cooking yeah being one of the most institutionalized people that I know going straight from school to the army yeah and that was boarding school to Sandhurst to the mess I, I didn't the first time I paid a bill <laughs> not including a mess bill yeah was in 2019 yeah because I've had no need to, I've never, I've never had to because I've been so caught up in the system, which has been great. Hmm. And it's the same with, it was the same with cooking. I'd never need, I'd never had to really cook myself because I lived in the mess. Yeah. Um, and I didn't need to cook myself. I'd, if I was cooking a ration pack, I'd cock that up. So why bother, <laughs> why bother doing anything else? Well, what was um, your favorite ration pack? Ah, uh, they're all they're all pretty horrendous. I seem to remember like a, a chicken and mushroom pasta one was pretty good. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I was sort of only in with the nicer. Uh, I didn't, I never had sort of the old school biscuit browns and things. I was a bit yeah. um, too, too much of a crow for that. So what um, year did you join? Uh, I joined in 2011. So you would have done when did you do PCD then in I did PCD in 2012. Yeah. Summer or going into winter 2012. Was you um no you I, I know you've only recently, you say recently, 2017, you you come into the Ultra game, but have you always been conscious of your diet and, and have you always been as fit as you are? Yeah, I think. I look at it as I was very military fit. Yeah. Uh, I come from a team sport background where I never was the best. I always wanted to be the best, but I never was technically the best, but I always tried the hardest. So I ended up being in the right place at the right time, but that was due to probably making a mistake and being in the wrong place. Yeah. So I then worked really hard to get into the right place. And so playing rugby 
for example, I would always make try saving tackles and I would always um, get interceptions and charge downs because I just worked really hard. Yeah. Um, and I was, I was good at running, but I didn't really enjoy it. Um, yeah. Because it was friends, forced upon us. Yeah. And I want, I want to be, I want to be my mates who all play rugby. And then when I joined the army, the Welsh Guards, obviously a very, a Welsh regiment, so a very rugby orientated regiment. And I was the only, in my first two years, I was the only officer playing for the battalion. Yeah. Um, which was, which for me was a huge honour. So I did that. And I guess like to keep fit, I spent a lot of time in the gym. I then got really into CrossFit because I enjoyed the functionality side of it. And I think it goes really well with, certainly when I was leaving the army and more in the process of doing my running, there was far more of a CrossFit style of PT in the army than the very old fashioned press up, sit ups and running. And I'm sure there still is that to a certain extent, but I think it, it has got much better. And I think yeah. that, that generalist training, there's a guy you probably heard of um, called Ross Edgley. Yeah. Who, who speaks Swam. a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Swimmer, but also yeah. a bodybuilder yeah. and is massive, but swam around the coast of Great Britain. Yeah. He, he speaks about sort of general preparedness training which is just completely non-specific training, which is what, which is what has, I think has made me a good ultra endurance athlete is because I have done foundation training from when I was young. Yeah. Now I'm doing the specificity. I'm specializing in yeah. something, but I've already got all of those, sort of those foundations, those building blocks that actually yeah. just a little bit of specific training, then you can really excel. Yeah. Um, so you said about <laughs> PCD in 2012. I was I was on senior Brecon at, at the same time. Um, one of the questions is, what was your Brecon two mile at time? Oh, I don't know. Um, I was ne- I was just never like I assume I would be very surprised if I didn't win. Yeah. Um, but I couldn't I couldn't tell you what it was. I I'm so unobsessed with. And especially when I was now slightly more so obsessed with it. But in the other yeah. I was so obsessed with timings. Like I ran PFT. I did a sub seven minute PFT. Yeah. Um, which people are like, oh, you must have gone the wrong way. I'm like, well, no, I, this is the way that I went. I yeah. know it's must be wrong. Um, but I, I was better. People would say, oh, you're quick. So you must be terrible with weight. Yeah. I was better, I was better with weight um which is why i think sort of multi-stage racing yeah i think i'm i'm quite good at because i'm still pretty efficient at carrying yeah it might not be particularly heavy but it's we seven or eight kilos that you're carrying that i'm pretty used to and yeah. conditioned to. Uh, and actually if i want to do it again i would need to do a little bit of specific training but um yeah not too much was it was the cut list for change so when you joined the military obviously we know military is a military is a, a career. Twenty two years. Were you were you signed up for that? Was that the mindset you joined the military with, or was it get in and then t- use it as a stepping stone? Was MDS a, a catalyst for you to go hold on? I could make something new. Yeah, MD, MDS was, but it, that definitely wasn't the plan. I think when I joined, so I joined at eighteen, um, so went straight from school to Sandhurst, and which was pretty rare most officers had been to university and then sat So I was young, which just meant I had time, um, which then meant that I was, I was a platoon commander for seven years. Yeah. Um, and my view and my, yeah, my view when I was going through the army was I will keep doing this until I stop enjoying it or until yeah. I get told that I have to do a job that I don't really want to do. Yeah. Um, and I was so fortunate to be able to platoon command for, for such a long time um, because that's what I was interested in. Um, yeah. I loved it. I loved being able to spend time, spend time with the boys. Um, and I felt like you actually make a real difference. Whereas I spent a couple of weeks as a stand in company second in command and I absolutely hated it. Knees to chest. Yeah. It was just, 
you just couldn't make any difference at all because you were just being spammed left, right and center. Yeah. With crap taskings and you were just constantly letting people down. Whereas actually as a platoon commander, you had a little bit more of a say and you could, you could yeah. mug some things off that you didn't have to do. And yeah, you'd probably get in trouble for it at some point. Yeah. But actually, it's for the best of your blokes. And you could manage your men a bit better. Precisely. And you could, you could fight the fires for them. Whereas for me, it was you take any step higher and it's just, you end up just messing, messing people around. So had I not started running, do I still think I'd be in the army? No. Um, was, it really I, for, was it really for a bet? Yeah. That's, that's amazing. That is yeah. Amazing. It's, uh, I think it, it just, I think it really sums me up. Like I'm so yeah. not fiercely competitive, but I am so, I'm so competitive and I'm so, I get really into things really quickly. Yeah. So if I decided tomorrow that, Oh, I really like cricket for example, I would become obsessed. Yeah. And I'd probably spend a year or two being really obsessed. And then I'd find something else that I liked. And for me, running has always been in the back of my mind of something that I've always, when I'm doing it, I've always loved it. Yeah. And yeah, when I said, oh, I bet I could beat you, it was a, I'm going to, I'm so stubborn and competitive that now I've said it, I need to do it. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it was, yeah, it, it was a pretty, a pretty crazy time. And I nearly ended up not doing, not being able to go on Marathon de Saab because we failed an exercise <laughs> that we then had to do an extra day and some simulators it in, uh, um, Salisbury Plain. Yeah. In a simulator. And my commanding officer said, no, you're not allowed to go. Imagine, imagine like not going. Imagine what it's been. Two days before. So the, the, the week before I did Mountain Sub, I was sat in a simulator on Salisbury Plain. Where in all it? my competitive and all the people that I was racing against were Out preparing there. properly. Yeah. I was eating ration packs. Do you know Guest Davis? There'll be are there are, I'm, in the Welsh Guards. There'll be a lot of oh, Roy Welsh, Roy Welsh. I'm Roy sure he done. I'm sure he done Marathon de Sabs around about that time. No, he's, there was a. He's the one that's climbed one, Everest. Big guy. No, he's uh, quite a slight guy. He's, he's a Roy Welsh. He's a, the youngest Welsh guy to climb Everest. Okay, no, I don't know. Yeah, um, I'm sure he done it around the same time as you. To be fair. Okay, yeah, it, it's a very military thing. There yeah. Were lots, there were quite a few RDG guys who did it when I did it. Um, and I did it for Walking with the Wounded. Um, yeah. And, yeah, I think it's, it's, it's such a cool race in Jets. Well, Glenn, it's, that runs Vet, I run with me. Um, he's obviously signed up to it. has been delayed and delayed and delayed. He's doing it for Walking with the Wounded as well. Yeah. He's, a, he's a veteran himself. Yeah. Um, I take it at this point then, Tom, you, you're self-coached. Obviously, you've you've taken a bet. Are you have you hired a coach, or you just gone off a training plan that you've conducted yourself? At this point, I was. If I had an hour, I'd run for an hour. Yeah. If I had two hours, I'd run for two hours. <laughs> and if the boy, if I was writing our platoon PT program, so it was there was probably a bit more running in our in for our platoon than anyone else's because. Yeah. I wanted to run, um, but I might do, if we were doing an hour easy run, I might do half an hour before, half an hour afterwards as well. What was your uh, weekly mileage? I, I tend to run pretty high mileage. Um, I, I sit and I have always sat really comfortable. Since I've started running, I've just sat really comfortably sort of between 80 and, yeah, put it at this point, of 80 miles a week. That must, um, have, been, that must have been like for... To put that into context, in in a in a normal job, eighty miles a week is is hard to fit in. But in the military, especially when you're on like exercise, you're doing courses, you're managing men. That must have that must have been hard work. 
It was really hard. And I think what I found and sort of my ultimate reason for leaving the army with running was I just didn't have the consistency. Some yeah. weeks would be really good and I'd run 80, 90, 100 miles. Yeah. Other weeks would run 10, 15, 20 miles. Um, you just can't compete then, can you? No. And like, and even some days, like you had a big workout planned and something happened and you ended up having to go to Colchester to go to court for the day. You didn't know if you're going to have to stay overnight. So you brought all your running kit and you're just waiting about all day and you ended up not having lunch. So then you ended up not running because you've not eaten since breakfast. And then you're in the car and you don't get back until 10 at night. And then you've got to hand your car in in the morning. Like things just, there was just no consistent, there was just no consistency. And you're just constantly being not messed about because it's some a lot of the time it's not actually anyone's fault it's just this is the pace that things move yeah it's work yeah the nature of the beast and but it's not it's not it doesn't work with being a professional athlete or trying to be as good as you possibly can in one area because for that you have to be really focused and be really dedicated and with all the best intentions you can't and also like for me i would find that we'd go to we'd go to the sergeant's mess or for the Christmas around Christmas time that you want to be a part of everything that's going on. But at the same time, you're like, right, well, I want to try. I've, yeah. I've got a three hour run tomorrow morning and I should be running now. So yeah. I ended up yeah. having to make lots of sacrifices that in a family regiment, like the Welsh guards, it wasn't frowned upon because people knew what I was doing, but yeah. I felt like I was missing out a lot. So for me, like I said earlier, I'm very much an all or nothing person. And yeah, in order to be as good as I possibly could be, I needed to solely concentrate. Because didn't they, didn't they at some point, Welsh Guards, like, when did you make the the concerted decision to go, right, I'm going pro? Because didn't they allow you to go away and race for a bit or give you a bit of leeway once you once you said, right, I'm locking a turn pro? What what yeah. point was that? What after what, after were, what race? Geez, the, the army was okay. But the Welsh Guards were incredible. Yeah. Um, I, I was told that if I medalled at the Trail Running World Championships, that I would be able to not have a job in the army. Yeah, but still, still be in the army. Train. Yeah. But because ultra running and trail running is not an Olympic sport and not recognised by the army, it's a hobby... I wasn't allowed to be put on a elite athlete pit. Program, yeah. Precisely. So basically what I had to do is I had to have a job. My name had to be next to the title pit, of the job. Yeah. But I didn't do anything. Yeah. But because I was the spare officer, when the battalion were busy, I ended up having to do some things yeah which it makes me sound a bit ungrateful it was probably not no because if, if you look at other sports the 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 like you said there the, the professional sports like if you're rugby if you're boxing if you're football you that is you you're you're the way you're attracted to you're representing battalion to be then called back from your training i i can i can see the frustrations yeah. there 100 you, you couldn't get the consistency but it was amazing. It gave me a real, it gave me real insight. But yeah, there were times when I would be on a training camp in the US and I'd get a message from my adjutant saying, you need to do these reports and they need to be in, in six days time. And I'm like, well, I can't yeah. because I'm not here. You said I can go away. And he's like, right, well, I'll give you a week long extension, but then they have to be done. So you yeah. end up, Sort of panicking for your last couple of, and it just wasn't con- yeah, it just wasn't really conducive but yeah. having said that the support was the support was incredible um and still is now like i get a lot of messages from from soldiers some who are still serving some who have left in the welsh guards um i think you'll, I mean- al- you'll always be that tom i think it's like when um when i come across you obviously we're, we're both welsh regiments um, you'll always be that Tom was Welsh Guards. Um, so f- I think everybody that mentions you knows that, like, yeah, you you were formerly Welsh Guards, now you're a, a pro athlete. Like, 
Um, even Chris Reese stated, he said, uh, tell him I, I managed to keep up with him for the first 50 metres of a PFA. I'm not sure about that. <laughs> uh, and somebody said, yeah, I don't believe you one bit. No. But yeah, I think, yeah, I think you'll always be that, um, that soldier and then obviously recognise that. Was it Western Sits? Was the day before, day after that you actually left the army? It was the day after. So I left on the thir- officially left on the 31st of June. Yeah. And then Western States was the 1st of July. That is mad. Having said that, my last six months in the army, <laughs> I, was in I was in Ethiopia for three months. My last six months, I did very, very little. Yeah, because um, you I, I take it this time you were signed with Red Bull then anyway, were you? Or yeah, yeah, I was signed with Red Bull, signed with Adidas. So it was a yeah. It's a it's a fine line of what you're allowed to do and what you're not allowed to do. Yeah. In the army's eyes, you are working for the army 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and you cannot be paid by anyone else during the army's time. Yeah. So as a sponsored contracted athlete, I was being paid at the same time. Yeah. As I was on the army's time. Yeah. So it was conflict of interest. Yeah, slightly blowing the line. So, but yeah, once it was decided, right, I'm leaving, I managed to get early release. Um, I didn't want to do any courses really because probably a little bit short sighted. I was like, I want to be a runner. Yeah. I want to be a professional athlete. I can't really be bothered to do courses. I've got all the qualifications that I need. And yeah, I just wanted to train. Um, So I trained instead of doing, I trained instead of doing courses and, but I could use training camps as part because that was, I was almost doing an apprenticeship for my trade. Yeah. Um, so they, and they were fantastic and they, they probably knew that I was trying to pull the wool, but they were just like, well, you're leaving anyway. We're not going to get any value out of you now. So we might as well just uh, let you crack on. Yeah. Uh, before I come on to the questions to, from the guys, Tom, I just want to, I just want to highlight, I think what, what everybody's thinking in, in regards to when I said I was speaking to you is the versatility you've shown from stepping into the after game. And then I, I, I watched you race that 5K. Um, the, the, the carry over of speed and then to be entered into and run a 63, was it in the world champions half marathon? Yeah. Half marathon? Like, where, where does that come from? So, like, most people just specialize in, in one in one area in regards to if if they're a 50k specialist or 50 mile or 1500, they they'll stick to that. But to come from that to then be selected for the world championships half marathons and running a, a 13 minute 5k, like how what sort of training are you putting in there? I think just going back to the sort of generalist training, I think I have just trained my body really well that it's just it is then so, I then adapt so easily to, or not easily, yeah. it's hard training. I adapt quickly to what I'm training for. So if I decided that right, I want to run a sub four minute mile, I think with six weeks of training, I could probably do that. Yeah. Um, or if I decided, right, I want to run a hundred miles, I think I'd probably need maybe a little bit longer, maybe eight to 10 weeks-ish. And yeah. I'd be able to do it. So, and I think that's a, a little bit of genetic, or quite a lot of genetics of allowing me to do that. Like, I will never be the best shorter distance runner, but I can be good. Like, yeah, I run 1341, which probably puts me top, 2%. top 10 in the UK, yeah. maybe top 15 in the UK at the moment. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I loved it. Like, it was great fun and to be able to represent great britain at the half marathon world championships is is great and being an ultra running specialist but like at the end of the day i see it as running it's running i yeah you've got good form or you don't yeah and you can do what you can do a lot to improve that yeah um and i think it's too many people a lot of time too many people look for the marginal gains for the one percenters for the two percenters who actually there's a lot that you could change that wouldn't be a 1% or a 2%, it would be a 10%. Yeah. Um, and yeah, and I think what I've done really well over the years is sort of get those, get those big gains to be made 
streamlined. So the foundation is is much better. Um, so then when I want to do a race, I can train really, I can afford to train really specifically for Short, it. Shorter blocks, because like, you're already... Yeah. Yeah, you're ready. It's like you said, if you wanted to do a 5K, you can go, right, I can train for a couple of weeks and you're ready for that anyway. Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. And, I, and it's just it's just training. It's just being smart with it. Like, you don't train for something that you're not doing. Yeah. Like, it doesn't, is it, if I was training for a 100 miler, would I be doing max intensity hill reps? No. Yeah. Because it's pointless. But some people see that some people think that you have to work really, 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 really hard in training and you have to be sick and all of these things. Like that's just as an endurance runner, no, that literally couldn't be further from the truth. Yeah. Like, yes, you will be tired the whole time and you will live on caffeine. But you should never feel so you should always feel like you could do another set or like you could do another. 10 minutes of running yeah and um, get up and do it again the next day like yeah, until race day because consistency is the key and with yeah. if you're not consistent then you, then you can't perform and i mean it's, it's the same it's the same with the army like you see the good soldiers are typically good at everything yeah um, and they're the ones that then end up progressing and and doing better and they've just got a really good foundation like and using the military phrase basics done well yeah like that is that is quite literally it running yeah. If you break it down into the simplest terms, you are moving one foot in front of the other as quickly as you can for a certain distance. Yeah. That's it. It's not rocket science. Yeah. There are a lot of basic skills that you can do in order to maximize your chances of being, being as good as you can be. And that's just what I've, that's just what I've tried to do. I don't do anything particularly fancy. I just work bloody hard on basic things my nutrition is really good my sleep is really good my training is good yeah i do the little things outside of training that are my one percenters yeah. the majority of it is just basic training basic yeah. eating basic sleeping i, I don't overcomplicate it yeah and that, and i think that sort of makes it easier to stick to if you, if you stick to the basics and make it simple oh, 100%, 100%. and 100 yeah. yeah you try and make it all complicated and it can sound great <laughs> but it then gets really confusing and really complicated. Like, I, I, I've not got time for this. Right, let's get on to the um, the question board. So, Sean Molino. Yeah. Uh, what's your greatest achievement and why? Very good question. I think my greatest. We keep on running. My greatest running achievement is. I I think Marathon de Saab. Um, for me, it was proving to myself and I think to other people what is possible if you work hard. Yeah. Um, yes, there's genetics involved, but it's Marathon de Saab is a pure endurance race where the, the definition to of endure is a long time being uncomfortable. Yeah. Which is what the army is, which is what Marathon de Saab is. And for me to be able to finish on the podium is still incredibly surreal. Um, I still, when I see pictures of me doing it, I'm like, I almost <laughs> can't remember doing it. Yeah. It's mad. And it's one of the races that I am really, really excited about going back to um, yeah. and trying to better... I'm sure I can better because I am a different athlete now. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's that's that's definitely on there. Mega. So I think that links in next perfectly to the next question. So a couple of people asked the same question in and about the same way. Uh, uh, in and about the same way, but um, they worded different. So sticking with that, how would you how would you cope with things when when things get tough, like a mindset have you got any mantras you, you say to yourself or do or so i think with ev with everything one of the first things that you need to do is to accept it i know i can look at my training program or i can look at a race i can almost pinpoint where it's going to hurt and where it's going to get tough and you can do the same thing on if you're on exercise right 
day one of no sleep, day, night one of no sleep, fine. Night two, yeah. miserable. You know it's going to start hurting there. And it's the same when I'm running. So I get to, let's say, a certain race, a certain climb in a certain race. Like, right, I know this is going to hurt. Yeah. I know I'm going to be feeling sorry for myself. And then actually then when it happens, I've accepted that it was going to happen. I'm like, right, well, it's here now. You knew this was going to happen. Yeah. So you've just got to deal with it. And, and like I used to get a little bit anxious on start lines and I guess a bit, a bit of what people would overcomplicate and call imposter syndrome, um, where I just basically felt like I didn't belong because yeah. I had done a couple of races and that was it. Um, whereas actually I've got as much right to be there as anyone else. And as is anyone, if you put the hard work in, if you put the hard graft in, then yeah. you deserve to be there. And it's only yourself who who can be the judge of that and you can't measure yourself against other people because you don't know what they've done. They don't know what you've done. Um, and yeah, let the, let the legs do the talking rather than everything that's, that's going on around you. And I, I trust, I trust everyone around me. I am not the best nutritionist. I am not the best coach. I am not the best strength and conditioning instructor. So what I have done is I have gone to, the people who I think are the best. And by that, I mean the people who are the best for me. Yeah. And I've got, and I've started working with them so I can be as good as I possibly can be. And I'm not being afraid to ask for help. And I think that then really helps mentally that actually I've got other people who I'm not necessarily holding accountable for when things get tough, but actually when things are getting tough, these people have put everything. Invested, put. Yeah. This should work. This yeah. will work. Yeah. So stop feeling sorry for yourself. Keep going. Just don't stop because every step you take, you're getting close to the finish line. And imagine how crap it's going to feel 10 minutes after a race where you've not achieved what you wanted to achieve or you've DNF or something. Yeah. Because you're the, per you're the only person who's got to deal with it 10 minutes after. Yeah. That, no that's, like, that's like a light switch going off in my head. That, that resonates so true with me, what you said there. Like when I was... Um, like I've, I've done many ultras, but I've never like trained seriously or been coached or done anything like I've just completed rather than competing. And when I, I was like, oh, I'm going to be a, a semi-serious run. I was like, right, what's the, what's the goal everybody aims for is sub three hour marathon flood, right? I'll go for that. But everybody talked about hitting the wall at 20 miles, uh, 32K. And, and for me, when I tried it first, it didn't come. But then when at 35, I hit the wall, I wasn't expecting it. And I was, it sort of threw me out and I, I run 301. But then when, yeah. then when I went back the next time, I was like, there is no way that wall is going to beat me at 35K. I said, like you just said there, I knew it was going to come and I was ready for it. So then I run 257. So yeah. like that, that well, you, there's a light switch moment there. This resonated with me too. It's like I knew it was coming. I was expecting it. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I think it's so important because you can be afraid of these things. But I, oh, look yeah. it in a, I look at it in a very military way. And you yeah. look at, there was something, I'm putting get this all wrong, but like a, a risk register. Yeah. And with a risk, what do you do when you're a risk? Do you accept the risk or do you reject the risk or yeah. what you do? And I say it's the same, with, the same with, with this. Like you've got to accept it. And if you don't accept it, if you're going to reject reject the pain then yeah. find something else because these things are going to hurt yeah. not not hurt as in you need to get injured yeah but mentally it's going to be really tough not just during the race but in the training because you're going to make end up making a lot of sacrifices and yeah. when you get onto the race and if you think oh this is actually getting a bit too tough i'm going to quit now so like, well think about all the hard sacrifice all the early mornings all the late nights all the missed birthday parties the times that you've pissed off your missus and things <laughs> all the early out. mornings yeah yeah exactly so it's yeah you're the only person who can make yourself do it um mega and, belie and believing in that is is key mega um nutrition what's your your post post race pre-race uh during race and pre-race post race and during so pre-race, really basic. I, I cut all fiber and caffeine out of my diet about a week before. Is that to get um, the effect of, do you use caffeine in the race then? Yeah. 
Yeah, and I swear by caffeine. I find it so difficult coming off caffeine, not because of the caffeine kick itself, but just of yeah. the process of making a coffee in the morning, like yeah. the taste. So I'll end up drinking decaf, um, which tastes exactly the same. Yeah. Um, and I then cut all fiber out. Um, what fiber does, it just stays in your stomach. It's water retention. So one, you drop a little bit of, of weight that's just water retention. And two, it just reduces the risk of having anything GI. in your stomach so you're not going to hopefully you're not going to get any gi issues so it's not particularly healthy because i don't eat fruit and veg the week of a race right um, so i take more supplements i take more sort of multivitamins to make sure i'm still getting the benefit yeah. of fruits and vegetables but just without the without the load and without the volume um during race, it really depends on the race and it really depends on how I'm feeling. But a real a real mixture of real food, gels, sports drink. I'll start using caffeine. Um, normally I'll have I'll have caffeine at the beginning of a race just before we start. Um, and then I'll sort of keep drip feeding through until I really start to get tired and I'll just start smashing the caffeine because actually your body can absorb so much. And if you've got a good stomach and you're able to tolerate it, then then that's fine. And um, a lot of people ask, do I do I actually drink Red Bull? Yes, I wouldn't advertise something that I didn't yeah. use. For me, Red Bull is it is the equivalent of a caffeinated gel. It is quick release sugar and caffeine. Yeah. Which as an endurance athlete or anyone who is doing something that is putting themselves through pressure and it's hard and they need extra energy or extra focus and actually come the end of a race yeah. is when I need the most focus because you're the most tired, but that's when you've really got to concentrate. So you don't go the wrong way. You keep picking your feet up so you don't fall over and bang something on the way down your final hill. Um, Post-race, a little bit different. Post-training, I'll have something pretty much straight away. Normally, I normally don't have a particularly good appetite after a hard training session. So it'll be liquid and I try and eat as much real food as I can. So if it's a, a recovery shake, but made up sort of as a smoothie, so maybe with milk, banana, natural yogurt, um, some honey, some peanut butter. If I'm feeling, that's if I'm feeling not very lazy, but if I have a hard session, I'm feeling lazy or I've driven to training, then I'll just have a protein shake recovery um, in the car. But pro, post-race, Ali, whatever I want. Um, <laughs> yeah, I don't. Uh, I don't. I, you you can't take life too seriously. No. And if you can't be at the top of the mountain the whole time, yeah. and actually, the psychological benefit of eating the things that you actually really want to eat is great. Um, and actually, yeah. go, going back going back to the nutrition point of doing more cooking during lockdown, I used to see food as nutrition, whereas now I see food as food yeah. because I can now eat really tasty food yeah. that is still hitting all of my nutrition goals. Yeah. And it's not just eating broccoli, rice, and chicken, yeah. um, which sometimes needs to happen. But a lot of the time I'd rather eat nice tasting food that I've enjoyed cooking and I then get to enjoy eating. I've when uh, you talk about nutrition through the race, have you got a, a staple that you always go to, like a, a favoured uh, brand of gel or a favoured food, like a uh, peanut butter sandwich or something that you always go to that you know is going to work for you? And it, uh, What's your favourite type of brand? So hard food, uh, I like mashed sweet potato in a wrap. Um, sorry, dogs are barking again. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, mashed sweet potato in a wrap um with some salt and pepper i think that's for me it works really well um it's purely just carbohydrate which is great um gels wise geez, i like i really like to mix it up um i've used a lot of morton uh, i think morton's been really good but i started using sort of sis beta fuel gels gels that sort of pack a bit of a punch like i don't yeah. I'm already carrying water, so they don't need to be watery. So I'd rather get more carbohydrate in them. So I'm probably looking at more like a, sort of 30 to 40 grams of carbohydrate per gel, whereas a normal gel is only 25 grams of carbohydrate. Yeah. 
it doesn't seem like that much of a difference, but when you're trying to consume somewhere between one and 1.5 grams of carbohydrate per kilogram of body weight. Yeah. So if you're, if you weigh 70 kilos, you're trying to take between 60 and 80 grams of carbs per hour. If you've got a 40 gram gel or 40 grams of carbohydrate gel or a 25 grams of carbohydrate gel, you're going to need to carry significantly less 40 gram gels yeah. so it all comes into a bit of that and as long as you've got a good stomach and you're and your stomach is able to it. that much carbohydrate going into your body at once then yeah, yeah you're you're on to a winner and that's that you train i train to eat on the move um because the majority of dnfs happen and the majority of bad performances happen because of stomach issues yeah the people who neglect the people who ask, oh, I've got a race next week. What should I eat during it? It's like, well, if you don't know, too lit. Yeah. You don't know now what you're going to eat, it's too late. You too need lit. to be two months out. You need to know roughly what you're going to have. May not know the exact gel or the exact brand, but you need to be tra- you need to be training, taking on food. Yeah. Um, Sorted. Um, right. Uh, Glenn, Glenn wants to know, obviously you're sponsored by Adidas, but what brand did you use before? Um, were, you, were you Adidas before? Or were, were you a real, a real mixture? I I signed with Hoka for a year um, and really liked the shoes. I thought they were really good. It was a it was a really fun brand to work with. But I had always go growing up to, through school through the army. I'd always worn Adidas, and when the opportunity arose and the vision of where Adidas Terex wanted to go and to really be involved in the R&D of products and to be able to have custom products made for me, I can then give the insights and then these shoes, these packs and things come to light. It's been such a fun journey. And yeah, yeah. I'm, I've signed that as the next four years. Um, and there's some really exciting stuff coming, which yeah, I'm so thankful for. And yeah, yeah it's supported me through the highest of highs and the lowest of lows and literally just before this call had a had a whatsapp from my athlete manager in germany adidas um just checking up making sure i'm okay mentally and physically so that's awesome. sort of Support. they're the sort of people that you want to work with and we speak a lot about who do you want in your corner and for me is getting a big a big check twice a year worth it well Yes, it's good because it allows me to keep being an athlete, but would I take it if I was going to have a poor service and a poor relationship? No, I wouldn't because yeah. I'd, much rather take, I'd much rather take less but have a good relationship and a future rather than just be solely focused around the money. But you're yeah. a professional athlete, you need to live. Um, so, you know, I am, I'm incredibly fortunate. All of my, all of my partners have just been, have just been superb through COVID and, and into yeah. this year now with my injury and yeah it's really you feel really well looked after um which is is what you want yeah um last couple of questions tom i, I appreciate they've taken up a, a bit of your time is um bucket list races is there any races that you haven't done that you'd like to do yeah so i've raced i've raced ccc at utmb twice um and I, i'm next year i'm planning on doing utmb um, so that's a definite bucket list. Uh, Trans Grand Canaria, which I'll also do next year, um, and then I guess sort of the two, the two other key ones: the Hard Rock um, that I really want to do, and then a bit of the curve, a bit of a curve, or at some point I want to do the Barkley Marathon. <laughs> yeah, I see now with uh, John Kelly this time. Yeah, um, I think it's, it's such a military event. It's navigation, yeah. which. I get banter about not being able to do because I'm an officer. Officer, yeah. <laughs> I reckon I, I could, I would have been the designated map reader in yeah. the record. Yeah. Uh, it's one thing that I can do. I'm not, I wasn't very good at many things in the army, but reading a map was one of them. Yeah. Would um, you go out and do the comrades? Uh, yeah, I'd love to at some point. Um, I, got out just, the, I got out and done that in 2009. Oh, amazing. What, what did you think? It was, it was massive. It's the world's biggest ultra marathon, isn't it? Um, I got to meet uh, Bruce Fordyce as well, which was amazing. Um, and yeah, it's, it's a huge crowd. Yeah, oh, it's massive. 
But yeah, it's a brilliant race, beautiful race. I was planning on doing it last year. Um, it obviously got cancelled and then moved to this year, but then this year has also been cancelled. So yes, I'd like to do it, but what really interests me is the trails um, and all the ultras on the trails. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I, it'll be a nice, it'll be a nice to have, but not so much. It's also it's a non uh, it's a non drug tested race. Um, and I feel incredibly strongly about doping yeah. sport. Um, yeah. And I don't really want to be a part of yeah. any race that haven't got a thorough anti-doping policy. Yeah. And, and finally, to wrap things up, Tom, is uh, if you were to go back to yourself before you started taking running a little bit more serious, what advice would you give yourself? I think I do take myself seriously. Um when I'm in blocks of training, I, like I said earlier, I do become obsessed. I get so, I get such big tunnel vision. And I think my main advice would be to find something and find something early that you can switch off from running and do that thing, whether it's making coffee or we've got chickens. Now we've got two dogs. Uh, I'm doing up a defender we bought a house last year. Yeah. Um, I get all of these things that I had never, I thought, oh, in order to be an athlete, you should never go to train as much as you can. But actually for me, having these other things in my life has been arguably even more important as it's helped to keep me sane and to help to keep me motivated, knowing that actually if, if something goes wrong, if I have a bad run session, then actually it's not the end of the world. There'll be another one tomorrow. Um, and I can just come back home. I can chill out. I can enjoy sort of time with my family. That's so for my fiance and the yeah. dogs, and the chickens, and the cars. And yeah, I think, yeah, that would be my, my biggest bit of advice to myself. Perfect. Tom, it's been a, an absolute pleasure. Um, hey, thank especially, you especially, much. especially, um, just looking at your, your mindset and the way you approach things and how you transition as well from, from the military. But um, thanks for coming on. And uh, I wish you all the best in, in the recovery and hope you, you, hopefully you, you'll make the, the race in March. Perfect. Well, thanks so much for having me. And uh, yeah, hope to, hope to see you out on the trails soon.